In the current global business scenario, organizations need to continuously explore opportunities to improve operational efficiencies and drive growth through innovation. But in order to achieve that, you need to streamline the diverse work streams of your organization while driving sustainable growth. And executing this plan calls for a team that is both experienced and qualified. This is where Nextime comes in. We are a global, independent, privately held and employee-owned business and professional services firm. Be it continuous performance improvement, ongoing support, or strategic initiatives and special projects, we can support and help bridge the gap between strategy and success. Our dedicated teams specialize in business services and professional services and act as a catalyst across all the verticals. We have been around for more than 55 years working with diverse companies ranging from multinational corporations to growing enterprises. Our offices are located around the world for global readiness to serve clients and support organizations <coughs> the next paradigm of business. To learn more, write to thinknext at nexttime.com. And hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. For those of you who are not already familiar with Nextime, I hope the preceding video provided a little bit of context for you. Nextime produces and broadcasts a thought-leading, knowledge-sharing webinar series entitled Diversify to Differentiate, Think India, Think Next. This episode is hosted with the support from the Consulate General of India in Chicago. The entire series explores opportunities for conducting and expanding business in India. Various policies and available investor incentives are always highlighted. Today, we're gonna to focus on the attractive opportunities available in the food processing industry. My name is Mark Lessam, and I am a senior executive director with Nextime. Like many of you, I'm a business executive with operating experience across multiple functions and industries. For the purpose of today's agenda, I partner with North American businesses seeking to transform their operations and or invest profitably into India and around the world. I'd welcome meeting with any of you interested in learning more. Our format today includes key insights from the Consul General of India in Chicago and the Director of Agricultural and Processed Food Products Export Development Authority, also known as APIDA. Following these two presentations, I will moderate an expert panel discussion with industry leaders. Now, before we begin, please note that you're in listen-only mode. If you have any questions, please share them with us through the Q&A box on the control panel. We will address your questions towards the end of the webinar or in writing if time doesn't permit us to cover them here today. I'd like to now welcome our speakers. The Honorable Amit Kumar a career diplomat who joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1995 and is currently the Consul General of India in Chicago. Amit has been pivotal in building long lasting relationships with foreign countries. He has held a number of diplomat diplomatic positions in the Indian embassies in Washington DC, in Tokyo, Beijing, Berlin and Ankara, as well as working in the Ministry of External Affairs in New Delhi. Amit has dealt with both bilateral and multilateral work in diverse areas such as political, strategic, and economic spheres. Dr. Tarun Bajaj is a director of APIDA, which functions within the Ministry of Commerce and Industry under the Government of India. APIDA is mandated to promote and develop the exports of agricultural and processed food products from India. Tarun has more than 25 years of experience in quality assurance, developing supply chains, increasing market promotion abroad, and handling marketing access issues. He has also represented India in international forums, including the United Nations Codex Alimentaria in Rome and the OIE in Paris. Suresh Chaturi is the vice chairman and managing director of Srinivasa Farms, a leader in the Indian poultry industry. Suresh leads the company and has played a crucial role in the company's growth and expansion for over 28 years. He's passionate about ensuring that the poultry industry is healthy and sustainable through adoption of latest technologies, good rearing practices, and welfare of livestock. Suresh's work has been recognized at a global level 
and he's engaged in advocacy for the poultry industry as the chairman of the International Egg Commission, the first Asian to hold this position. And finally, Mr. Kapinda Singh, CEO and Managing Director of Vista Processed Foods, a subsidiary of US headquartered OSI Group, a global leader in the food market. He has held this position for over two decades and has more than 35 years of experience in food processing in India and abroad. He has worked with some of the biggest and most recognized brands in the industry to include Nestle, PepsiCo, and Frito-Lay. Upender has extensive and specialized knowledge in the field of operations and focuses on operational excellence with safety and precision as his key tenants. He's passionate about adding value in agribusinesses through technology and innovation. I'd like to take a moment to welcome all of you and thank you for joining us. Already, we're fortunate to be able to have the opportunity to hear your insights today. Now, before starting the panel and diving into the food processing industry in detail, I'd like to take a few minutes just to understand the Indian landscape and some important socioeconomic trends that are impacting the country. As you could see here on the left, India has a large and growing economy. As a result, India is already high on the list of many companies for their foreign direct investment or FDI. In fact, highlighted on the right are some of the high profile FDIs made over the last year to include the Google Geo deal, the Saudi Aramco Reliance deal, and the Walmart and Amazon investments among others. Global giants like Dell, Apple, and Samsung have also, also recently invested in India. Some important statistics are depicted in the center of the slide. Personally, I found it interesting that 85% of the fastest growing cities in the world are located in India. And just like the United States, the targeted infrastructure investment is monumental. Please enjoy this brief video that summarizes why investing in India makes sense for all of us. So here you could see some major initiatives in the growth of the Indian economy. One of the key initiatives is the Atmanirbhar Bharat, which means a self-reliant India. This focuses on developing the country as a global manufacturing hub. Other key countrywide economic drivers include infrastructure development that we previously mentioned, the digital India transformation, and a market improvement in the ease of doing business ranking where India has reduced bureaucracy and streamlined processes for foreign investors. One comment on the Indian economy's resilience as related to the pandemic. As with all countries, when the pandemic hit early in 2020, the country's economic health suffered. The purchasing managers index graph clearly shows this dip. While the first wave was severe, India inserted systems and processes to ensure that the second wave did not impact the economic activity of the country as extensively. And you could see that through the difference between the April 2020 and the second wave, which is reflected in April 2021. These systemic interventions made a striking difference year over year and continue to do so. 
India's vaccination drive is in full swing with over 450 million vaccines administered to date. So that's a broad macro overview. And now I'd like to share some impressive statistics and trends about the food processing industry in India. The top left of this slide shows that the industry is expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 15.5%. Experts predict that the market will be worth $540 billion in a few short years by 2025. India is a global leader in food production, holding the number one or number two market position in key categories depicted here. However, the actual processing of these food averages out to only about 10% throughout the industry. So while India has a strong production position, there's a significant investment opportunity on the processing front. Further, the food processing sector allows 100% investment via the automatic route, meaning there's no formal government approvals required. As a result, the sector has realized cumulative investments to date in excess of $10 billion. Some of this investment has come from highly regarded companies listed here on the bottom right. Two additional creative examples of FDI into the processing sector include, number one, the Indian government, excuse me, the Italian government, which set up a new mega food park for Italian food processing companies with an investment of over $200 million and also a joint venture between CN, a leading Spanish food processing company, and IFCO, the Farmers Association of India, which so far has invested over $100 million to set up a food processing unit. So the food processing subsegments poised for growth can be seen here on the left. As the chart emphasizes, despite the fact that India holds global leadership on the production side, its processing levels need to increase by at least double the current amount to capitalize on that production. By trying to raise this level with technological integration or higher levels of processing, India can capitalize on the current production strength and improve the processing infrastructure. The aim is to move the country toward value-added processing and increase demand for high-value goods, as you could see from the column on the far right. With compelling levels of foreign direct investment, this can happen in one of two ways. Number one, India improves its technological synergies across the food processing industry. Or number two, India creates demand for more value-added products, which would indirectly lead to considerable upgrades in the processing ecosystem. So India has installed incentives and initiatives specifically for the food processing industry. The central government created various schemes to drive FDI. The most prominent are detailed on this slide, and I'll address them from left to right. The PMKSY scheme provides fiscal incentives ranging from 35 to 50% of the project cost for investments supporting the building critical infrastructure to raise processing levels. Examples include developing food processing units, food parks, cold chain infrastructure, agri-processing clusters, and more. The PLI scheme aims to bridge the gap for local demand and enhance value addition for select target companies, such as ready-to-cook or eat foods, processed fruits and vegetables, value-added marine products, and mozzarella cheese. Incentives are provided on net incremental sales ranging from four to 10%. Additionally, it also provides benefits to small and medium-sized enterprises engaged in innovation for organic foods and for commitments to promoting Indian food in international markets. Third, some Indian states consider food processing, processing a thrust or a focal sector, and they provide for additional incentives in the range of 10 to 15%. There are also incentives for new manufacturing setups in the form of a reduced corporate tax rate to 15% which will further boost investment. Another attractive incentive is the availability of a capital subsidy of up to $1 million from states with a focus on food processing. Additional incentives include duty waivers and tariff exemptions, amongst others. Now, depending on the operations, some of these incentives can be availed in combination. In summary, these incentives are expected to spur investments in the food sector 
and to help cement India's position as a global food manufacturing and processing hub. Now, before our panel discussion, a few words about Nextime beyond what you learned from that introductory video. Nextime is an award-winning employee-owned global business advisory organization that has been supporting foreign direct investment projects into India since the late 1990s. We understand, understand this space well and have helped businesses from over 50 countries establish and expand their local presence. Our expertise is industry agnostic and we have a significant presence with clients in the food prime manufacturing and the food processing sectors. In the United States, we're based out of Chicago and we provide multifunctional and digital capabilities across business services and professional services as we assist our clients with the integrated solutions to their complex challenges. For almost 60 years, our teams have supported businesses in their India entry and establishment journey, their expansion strategy, their business optimization, and their regulatory compliances, to name just a few of our specializations. So let's get right to it. I'd like to now call upon the Honorable Amit Kumar, Consul General of India in Chicago, to offer a few words. Mr. Kumar. Um, thank you, Mark, uh, uh, for your remarks. I think you have provided an excellent overview of the food processing sector in India. So I will, uh, in my remarks, add a few more points to that. But uh, first of all, at the outset, let me thank next time uh, to uh, help organize this important uh, webinar on the food processing sector in India and the opportunities that it holds for US companies. It's encouraging to note that there were more than 100 registrations. We have colleagues from APIDA and several senior industry representatives here who will be sharing their perspectives. So let, let me begin with a few words on the uh, on the political landscape between India and US. Um, India and US uh, are pursuing a strategic partnership. Um, our relations have seen a consistent upward trajectory over the past 20 years. Uh, it has undergone smooth transitions with change in presidencies and governments in both countries. Uh, and it's no different under President Biden's administration. Uh, we have seen visits by both foreign ministers to each other's country. Uh, we have seen a court level summit meeting, uh, a virtual one in, um, earlier in end of, end of March. And our discussions are continuing both at the political level and numerous uh, areas of functional cooperation. I think uh, in a sense, our, our cooperation has become so wide ranging that it would not be an exaggeration to assert that it touches almost every facet of human endeavor. We are cooperating on um, renewable energy, energy security, climate change, electric mobility, agricultural issues, um, transportation, um, and so on. We are also discussing strategic issues, working on strategic convergences in, in, on security, on, on Indo-Pacific, on our defense relations. Uh, we are pursuing knowledge-based partnerships, uh, trying to strengthen linkages between our universities, um, greater cooperation and technology, startups and innovation and so on. So that is the, uh, in, a, in a just the type of cooperation that we are, our two countries are pursuing. Um, Mark, you have very succinctly mentioned about uh, various uh, initiatives that the government has taken under the rubric of Atmanir Bharat, um, increased spending on infrastructure, uh, our initiatives on digital and financial inclusion, and so on. Um, the na new national education policy unveiled last year, uh, the Ayushman Bharat scheme, and so on. I just wanted to uh, add a word about Atmanir Bharat. Um, uh, we are, of course, looking to bolster our manufacturing capacity uh, so that we are more self-reliant in many ways. But this does not mean in any way that we are shifting away from our global engagement. And instead, our, our objective is to strengthen our capacities so that we can be more active uh, players in the global supply chains in various sectors. So I just wanted to make that a small point. 
And now turning to the Indian food processing sector, why should U.S. companies be looking at India? Uh, one obvious fact worth reiterating uh, is that we are a large domestic market. We have 1.4 billion people and have a rising middle class. Uh, the food processing sector in India is estimated to be around $250 billion today. And we our objective is to, uh, to raise the, or scale up the sector to around $540 billion by 2025. Uh, as Mark has mentioned, we are one of the largest producers of food in the world, um, largest producer of milk, pulses, and sugar, second largest producer of rice, wheat, uh, tea, and several fruits and vegetables. Yet when you look at the proportion of food processing in India, uh, it is less than 10%. It is very, very low compared to the developed world, or even when compared to countries like Mexico or Brazil, China and Vietnam, which are major food exporting countries. So, so there is indeed inherent potential for growth, both in the Indian market, as well as to leverage India's position as an export as an export hub for certain food categories. Um, I am aware that some uh, U.S. food companies are also looking at the using India as a hub for, to reach out to the South Asian market in particular, and some of them are using India's position to also scout for market opportunities in Southeast Asia. But quite clearly, if uh, I think if our initiatives work well, we implement our schemes well, I think a potential for exports is much more and to more global markets beyond the immediate periphery of India. Um, India in some senses is in a very preliminary stage of the overall food processing landscape. Um, so it was impacted by, by the pandemic, but uh, but in somewhat, uh, if I can use the word, somewhat positive sense, I think there is a greater acceptance among among general population about packaged food, uh, about processed food and ready to eat preparations, uh, frozen food. All these different uh, segments have gained wider acceptance among the population. Um, as Mark mentioned, the, the government of India has uh, announced several measures uh, implement is implementing several measures to attract investment into uh, into the food processing sector i will just focus on on one of the um, uh, measures which is the production linked uh, incentive scheme for the food processing sector i think this is in some ways a recognition of both the potential economic and employment multiplier effect for this particular sector um, of course, we are hoping that um, with more foreign investment coming in, we will be able to improve the food processing industry in India will be able to improve its competitive strength in uh, expanding quality of output, improving productivity, enhancing value addition uh, to the food, and as well as the linkages with global value chains. The strengthening of the food processing sector will also need or rather lead to more investments in cold chain supply chains, uh, in enhanced uh, capability for transport services to deliver products to wholesalers and retailers, um, capital investment, plant equipment repair, and so on. And the, the reason I'm mentioning this is we need to recognize that, um, that investment in food processing sector will lead to expansion of um, allied services uh, associated with the sector. And by some estimates in the US, which is a very mature food processing market, every job in the food and beverage industry leads to three additional jobs and other economic activities. So this, this is a scenario that we should and must replicate in India. Among the objectives behind the PLI scheme, uh, uh, we with an outlay of almost uh, 1.4 billion US dollars uh, is to also seek uh, not only expansion of processing capacity, but also improve improving branding of Indian products, increasing employment opportunities, and also ensuring 
better remunerative uh, prices for our farm produce and therefore assuring higher incomes to farmers. Um, the scheme looks at a five-year scenario where we are looking to create employment for 350,000 persons uh, and covers the, the entire spectrum of uh, the food processing sector. Um, I'll just make one last point to the food processing sector. I think there will be many opportunities in this area. I'll touch upon one, which we, despite being the largest producer of pulses in the world, we remain a protein deficient country. So government needs to look at other sectors like poultry, even look at increasing production of pulses, but equally uh, look at food processing um, uh, to see what else can be done. Um, from the from my exposure to the U.S. market here, I see I have seen, for example, black bean burgers being black bean patties for burgers which are being sold in the U.S. market here. They they are pretty good, and this is a type of thing which would be perhaps. Uh, looked at the Indian market, properly marketed, and so on. Uh, I will conclude my remarks by taking a, taking a brief look at the U.S. Midwest region and why this region is so important for India in terms of synergies in the food processing sector. Um, the U.S. Midwest region is one of the three agricultural builds in the U.S. as the uh, world's leading food processing area. It accounts for almost 90% uh, and 80% of corn and soybean production in the U.S. And the U.S. itself produces around one third of, of global output in these two uh, products. Uh, it is also a source for many important fruits and vegetables as well as wheat. Uh, some of the states in the region have particular strengths like Wisconsin in the dairy, uh, dairy market. Uh, Illinois for corn and soybean, uh, Minnesota and wheat, and so on. In terms of the food and beverage employment, five of the top 10 states in the United States lie in the US Midwest region. So therefore, it's not surprising that uh, this region is home to so many um, uh, large food processing companies, uh, which have a footprint in India as well. Uh, another important uh, thing to note is that uh, there are several leading universities in the region which have significantly invested in food research and agricultural production and so on. And food and beverages startups have also raised significant funding uh, to the tune of $750 million in recent years in the Chicago area, which is the premier hub for startups in the Midwest region. So I think if, if you look at uh, the strengths of the U.S. Midwest region, and if we look at opportunities in India, both for uh, in terms of reaching out to the Indian domestic market, uh, as well as to, to global markets, I think uh, there are, I think, a lot of opportunities that can be explored by companies on either side. Uh, thank you very much. And, and thank you, Mr. Kumar. Um, a couple of comments that I would make is I appreciate hearing the multiplier effect of the PLI, PLI scheme because I think that will be self-sustaining. And I also appreciate being a Midwesterner myself at the moment. Uh, I appreciate hearing the support for that region. And, and finally, I'm a big black bean burger guy. So <laughs> we can bring that. Uh, we can certainly uh, access that from India, that'd be great. I'd like to now turn to Dr. Prashaj, uh, Director of APIDA from the Government of India, who uh, I invite to remove the mute button and take center screen. Dr. Prashaj. Thank you very much. In fact, uh, Excellency has given an overview of the processed food industry in India and why US should look into this industry for investment. Uh, I'll take further to what Excellency has mentioned and supplement. You see, there are three sectors, important sectors as far as economy is concerned. One is agriculture, another is industry, and third is retail sector, consumers. 
and processed food industry brings a linkage between all these three industries and you will appreciate that uh, india is the sixth largest retail uh, market in the world and out of that uh, in india if you say 65% are food sector so that means a huge population the largest population which we have almost 60 to 65% we spend on food products so that's the domestic uh, development which is happening at the domestic front large number of middle class population and the working population which is coming up they are requiring processed food sector they are requiring items which uh, they can you know easy to use and in the in the day to day cooking they can use it without hassle and that's the thing that the development of food processing sector is growing we call it sunrise industry and that's the reason we are calling sunrise industry because every year there is a cagr growth of uh, 6 to 8% sometimes it is around 8 to 10% also depending upon the product category this is growing and look at the huge uh, base which we have the most important part is the production base india as excellency has given as mentioned in his uh, comments that india has the strong uh, production base we are number 1 and number 2 or number 3 in many of the sectors the strong uh, production base and the second largest arable land which we have it that makes us an important destination you see uh, you have a production like we in india with the huge production we have it and the processing as excellency has mentioned is less than 10% except milk where it is 35% in most of the cases it is less than 10% and in some cases it is even 2 to 3% look at the scope it is available and processing is need of the art if there was a study where we used to say that we are wasting uh, in post harvest losses we are wasting food which we can feed america but now of course that losses are coming down but still they are significant so they need processing every uh, item if you recollect will have it has a a category b category and also the last category the other category now a category goes for the table variety sometimes b category also goes for the table variety but you need the other things others for processing they are edible they are good but they are not the table variety but best for processing and that when is goes for processing that becomes economies of scale for the grower because 100% of or most of the produce is consumed and sold out otherwise he has to throw it the rest of the part at least which is not a table variety so we need processing very important sector and uh, in india if you see uh, the the sector which is growing also but Uh, the growth rate has to be uh, commensurate to the requirement to the need of the hour also important is that we are i mean besides feeding our huge large population we are also exporting 41 billion is the us dollar is the exports of food products we have done last year this was of course increase of around 29% as compared to the previous year and despite covid big numbers 41 billion did we lose you and this shows that india the so that confidence which the exports are growing of course we are feeling that the exports uh, the sectors which are now in demand are organic the health food sector the more value added products which are in demand and we have to focus more on that and we need uh, more and more entrepreneurs to come more and more investment to come in this sector we know in the coming times this industry will provide a lot of employment will help in increasing the incomes of our growers which is the focus of our honorable prime minister also it will help in improving its own uh, uh, the base and also uh, contribution in the gdp and also 
it will help in improving the incomes of the entrepreneurs also. In the coming times, uh, we feel the, as, as in, in, if you see the FDI also, it is increasing every year. Every year there is an increase of FDI. And this coming times, we are feeling that this FDI will double in, in a couple of, or maybe in three years time. Now, the last point, why US? Our top 10 countries where we are exporting, among the top three, top four is US. So our exports are happening to Middle East and to US. So why US? A, they can invest in India, on, uh, they can provide uh, uh, improvement in the processing sector within India. And at the same time, they can help in increasing the exports to other countries and also to US because um, it is happening now. And most of the products which are going to US are private label. So they are packed in the brands of US companies. So they invest in India, they get their produce packed in their own brand and they are selling it. So that's an added advantage for US, we call it. In the coming times, we are hopeful that Indian food sector will be very soon touching $100 billion. This is our aim. And $100 billion, which we want to touch in the, by 2025 for this, all efforts are required and government is putting their best. They are giving a lot of facilitations, a lot of incentives and encouraging and you know, single window clearance is there. Ease of doing business, we have improved our ranking and we are further improving. Everything is there. What we need is US companies to come and invest and benefit both. It is win-win for both, for India and also for the US companies. Thank you. Thank you. I, I love hearing the lofty but achievable goals. And I think that the audience today, much like you said, we're here because there's an interest in closing that gap between India's production leadership position and its processing. And the investment in processing, I think, is what the audience is here. And it's also interesting to hear you speak about incomes, which I'd like to maybe uh, touch on in just a minute. Uh, let's go ahead and invite the, the rest of our panel to the discussion and uh, joining uh, Mr. Kumar and Dr. Pajaj are uh, Mr. Chuturi and Mr. Singh. And if it's okay with you, I'll turn my first question uh, right over to Mr. Singh and make it a two-parter now that uh, Dr. Pajaj brings up the income question. So Vista Processed Foods, is an integral part of the OSI group, and you're engaged in the business of ready to eat or ready to cook food items. I'd like you to elaborate if you could on how the processing industry has matured over the years. And if you don't mind also, how are farmers integrated into the value chain to achieve the Indian government's vision of doubling the farmer's income? Uh, thank you, Mark. And uh, I, it was a nice talk by Honorable uh, Consular General and Dr. Tarun Bajaj, and uh, and also Mark, your views on on a very nice presentation. Let me tell you, you know, we've been in the industry for last 25 years, and we have seen a growth, right? And uh, as Mr. Uh, Amit has told, that we are deficient of protein, right? And uh, so we all are working very hard how we can. Uh, even our prime minister has focused last year on 15th August that how we improve pr protein intake uh, here. But we have seen a, a growth in technology. We have invested in India for the last 25 years. And the technology has helped. Uh, you know, I could uh, give you an example. When we started the bird weight was only, chicken bird weight was only 1.4 or 5 kg. Now we see bird weight going to 2.4 this huge efficiencies improvement, right? And, the, and this, this has helped the industry to you know, value add a lot of products. Uh, we have seen, uh, you know, as the industry was set up, we have seen a lot of exports. We buy a lot of IQF vegetable, we interact with farmers. We have seen vegetable with food safety and quality system coming into this supply chain has helped India to export. We, we've seen, Broccoli is going from the same farms which we certify to Japan. So we have seen a huge improvement in 
food safety and quality, which is building the uh, confidence of uh, importers. What major change, Mark, we have seen is it was very small scale earlier. I give you an example, 15 years earlier, the French fries were imported to India. Today we are exporting French fries, right? We have seen farmers growing the potatoes, the yields improvement, the technology coming in. And from a small scale of two, three tons per hour plant, the economics of scale, the plants now we are seeing coming in India is of 25 tons per hour. That will make us more competitive in the world and also uh, be in South Asian countries, we can supply, uh, be more efficient in that. We have also seen in the poultry industry where we operate, we had slaughterhouses. We were already short of good quality slaughterhouses. We had slaughterhouses of small size. I remember about 10 years back, it was very difficult to find good quality processing units. Today, we have processing unit all over. Yes, the scales is improving from 2,000 birds per hour uh, bird processing to 6,000 and now to 12,000. But still, uh, only 8 to 10% of uh, poultry birds are processed. We have still eight, 19 live birds being uh, uh, you know, shipped. So there's a huge opportunity in this category, which will also improve uh, the hygiene, sanitation uh, uh, condition of the cities. The industry is vital link between agriculture and customer, and it's a backbone of the economy. What we have seen, the farmers benefiting it by this. We have seen technologies coming in. We have seen uh, processing improvements happening in, in this area. Indian go India government is also driving the growth through multiple schemes, right? Mainly under Make in India. Th that initiative is very uh, big, you know, and the World Food Forum happened in 2017, which actually showcased India in a very big way worldwide, right? OSI do believe as a company in India business, a lot of potential has been uh, in India. We have been investing every year for growth and uh, you know bringing the capacity to the requirement of, uh, of, of the customers here is not only for India, but also for exports. That's what Mark I want to communicate. I appreciate that. And <clears throat> you also give me a nice segue over to Mr. Chaturi because you bring up the poultry industry. And so I'll go ahead and address my next question to Shresh. And Srinivasa Farms uh, has clearly been a crucial part of the Indian poultry industry. I wonder if you could explain how the industry has progressed over the past decade in terms of technology, value addition, and associated ecosystems, and, and even adding on perhaps to anything that Mr. Singh has mentioned. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Mark. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think in terms of productivity, Indian Indian poultry industry is, uh, I, I would say, as good as anybody else in the world. I don't think, uh, of course, uh, some of the technology issues is where we didn't see the need for it and uh, till now, but now we are moving. We are we are going into environmental houses and all that, and and I think the market is uh, uh, is uh, is changing. But I, I think the potential for change is much higher, um, and I think especially getting into more processed food. Uh, I mean, primary processing, not so much uh, high, high uh, uh, you know, what has a bad name today, which is high, uh, super high processed or ultra high processed foods. Uh, I think primary processing is is where I think there's tremendous opportunity. Uh, Mark, uh, uh, I think uh, we we I think we will have hundred series of million plus by twenty five, if not twenty five by twenty thirty. Uh, so if you ask me, then each city needs uh, three or four chicken processing plants. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, of course, then something like Mumbai and Delhi and I mean, the the, the top ten guys probably need more than that. Uh, so, but that's the direction we need to move in, uh, and and so that way the opportunities are phenomenal. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have the best genetics of the world in in, in the country now. Uh, our farmers are, as I said, they're as productive. But sometimes we are challenged by very extremely high raw material prices. 
uh, which is uh, completely out of sync with the world, uh, this thing. So, but in spite of that, uh, I think uh, at most times, because of our efficiencies, we're able to compete with the, with the lowest in like Brazil and US uh, at, at most times, as I said, but then, uh, but then we do have some issues come up uh, like like right now uh, where uh, soya is probably three times the price in us uh, right now in india so and i think and this is all i think uh, I, I i government is moving definitely they have some very good policies now uh, they have uh, uh, I, I think they are moving it but as uh, uh, you know but it takes time mark i mean uh, you know you can't hatch an egg in a day it takes 21 days so it, that way you know it takes uh, time for some of these things to come to fruition uh, of course i think uh, i i would still think government has uh, to do some more things i think more on the policy front uh, on the financing front especially i think uh, is is there some stuff they need to do uh, because i think we are heavily disadvantaged in how uh, the indian banks finance uh, and fund the Indian businesses. Uh, so that give, makes it a disadvantage. And that's a huge advantage for people investing in India who can get foreign funds, um, you know, uh, which uh, I think uh, uh, that's there. But the potential is phenomenal, especially for processing, Mark. Uh, um, I, I thought I, there was one uh, error in, your, in the data you presented, Mark. We are number three in the world, number not number five in the world in egg production. We will. We should be number two soon, and we will be adding a United States, which is number two every five to six years, for the next four five years, four five uh, times at least. So that's and and I think uh, and I think the food processing, especially in our sector, the meat sector, I think is going around twenty five percent. Maybe uh, uh, Bupinder could uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that. Uh, but I think uh, the, because that's going to grow phenomenally, and I think that's where there's a huge opportunity for people with capital because most Indian players are struggling for that. And I think we do not have uh, that access to that kind of capital. Uh, so I think that's a huge op uh, opportunity for people looking at investing into India. And and unlike in other agriculture, I think most of the meat and, and all that, I think uh, government is very, very welcoming uh, for FDI. Uh, I mean, it's... It's welcoming for all in processing, but I think more so in these areas. Mark, you're on mute. You caught me. Yeah. <laughs> um, listen, I, I was gonna say, I appreciate your reference to the egg analogy, given your position in the International Egg Commission. <laughs> I like how you worked it in there. Uh, and also the government, I think maybe now we can turn, if it's okay, to Consul General. Um, I, I wanna touch on the pandemic for just a minute. The, it's clearly severely affected the entire world. Uh, some countries like India, we hear in the press, has certainly been affected more than others. And we saw several expansion and set up plans that were delayed during this period. So now that the U.S. appears to be on the path to recovery, uh, and we have our problems still yet ahead of us, but uh, what are the U.S. businesses considering in terms of reinitiating some of these delayed plans, and how does India fit into those expansion plans? Um, thank you, Mark. I think it's a it's an important question uh, for us to consider. I think, as you said, no country was left untouched by the pandemic. Uh, uh, some more severely than others. And as you have shown your, I think one of the charts in your PowerPoint presentation referred to the impact of the pandemic, the first wave, the second wave, and how some of the measures that we have taken help mitigate some of the uh, circumstances. I think every government is faced with this. Uh, I think the major challenge is how to balance public health imperatives and, and economic activity. And that has been the key challenge. Uh, and I think we are moving ahead. Um, if you, you refer to the PMI data and others, if you look at the latest report, which came out two days back, um, it shows that uh, PMI manufacturing is at a three month high in July. So that is a helpful indicator. 
it doesn't say mean that we are out of the woods but i think in terms of generating confidence if you look at other parameters like gst collection uh, look at uh, energy consumption parameters so we certainly we are seeing a upward trend in economic activity um, the other effort of course uh, in this covid times is to vaccinate people as as many as we can and as quickly as we can so uh, for that government has set a target by the end of the year and hopefully will reach there and in the interim we will need to be cautious to be alert to any uh, local or regional um, outbreak that may happen um, another way to look at it in terms of resumption of economic activity is to look at trade figures for 2019 2020 and um, and for the first 5 6 year uh, for the first 6 months of the year last year of course initially we saw a dip by the end of 2020 the year closed with uh, bilateral trade figures which were almost at the same levels as 2019 so this in my view was impressive in in some ways in fact uh, in certain product categories like manufacturing our trade figures for 20 20 actually exceeded 2019 figures so which which was a bit of a surprise to me so i think overall if you if you look at these parameters these trends i think uh, there is a resumption of contact between both sides there is more trade happening and i'm sure the us companies would now be looking back at india the, the wider segment i think the technology companies uh, i think were already uh, uh, looking at india in a different way they uh, they they were one sector that Uh, sort of did very well during the pandemic in the us and so it was not surprising that they were looking at other emerging markets uh, where there is greater potential we have uh, investments from placed investments from all big technology companies uh, but it's not limited to that sector we we had a record uh, fdi coming in in the last financial year so uh, i think all these uh, perhaps in some ways refers to the potential ahead and Hopefully, uh, we will see um, uh, companies picking up their expansion plans soon. Yeah, I, I certainly appreciate your comments from a U.S. perspective. Um, but you know, I want to turn to the India exports now and ask Dr. Prajaj a question uh, because we know the past year, as Mr. Kumar has mentioned, as everybody knows, has certainly been challenging. Uh, but he spoke about some sectors that he actually saw an increase year over year, and despite the pandemic, agriculture was one of those few sectors that have grown. So, what do you think we should expect in the future of the food processing industry, and how has technology been integrated in to help promote exports? Future is bright. The answer is future is bright and very positive. as you rightly said yes there were few challenges uh, last year especially when there were uh, lockdowns and sudden lockdowns were announced there were challenges because uh, becoming difficult to operate the premises the factories logistics challenges were there operational challenges were there there in fact apida the organization which i represent we anchored it we came for the uh, food processing sector we helped and became a bridge between the local administration between the state administration and also the other agencies wherever they were finding it difficulty and we tried to sort out those difficulties to ensure that there is smooth flow and there is smooth uh, uh, production also of course you know because of the covid you had they had to follow the norms fifty uh, percent and the strength and all these norms were required to be followed but at the same time we ensured that the processing and the production should not stop except a few sectors which were affected and the one of the most affected sector is poultry because there was a local myth in the poultry and that affected for a few moment of course after when uh, uh, we started uh, um, communicating through the public media through the social media then the myth came to the level that they started um, accepting the reality and that this is a myth only second sector which was affected was meat because people were not allowing to operate slaughter houses uh, they were saying that the operating of slaughter houses may uh, some kind of uh, myths again were there so one or two months were very challenging 
up to june i will call you a very challenging month and up to june uh, when there were lockdown started from march april april and may and june they were very challenging production did affected it uh, got affected and it was um, in some cases 50% 30% in one some cases 60% was there but after june we started you know the production became almost you know uh, to a normal extent and then uh, we started uh, progressing further you will now see that out of the 12 months three months i'm saying we were affected and we were actually affected nine months were there so in nine months we have given a growth of 29% visa vis the last year 29% growth i will tell you in own total i am talking of food process so that means there is a promising and people started looking to the country started looking to india what happened india ensured to the countries that we will we will ensure that the contracts the orders are fulfilled we give you whatever the products you need give you the same quality or a better quality no compromise on the quality meeting all covid norms at the same time we ensure that the prices are not unnecessarily increased of course there were little bit increase in the prices because of the processing cost which is that one has to follow the covid norms but we ensured that the prices are also competitive all these ensured and in some cases you will appreciate uh, to ensure the food security need we also send uh, food products through a chartered plane to the countries wherever there was a demand that has ensured and that has made india a consistent supplier a trustworthy supplier and they can now look to india they are looking to india again now i come to now it is uh, see we we go by in india we have a financial year from april to march so we april may and june quick estimates have already come as per the quick estimates i'll just share with you this will answer your point these are last year i said 29% out of the 9 months which we got and this 3 months in the which are showing you will see in fruits and vegetable there is a, a increase of 9% in us terms and rupee terms of course it is 6% and the cereal and all the miscellaneous preparations which we say there is an increase of 69% in this first quarter and 65% of course in uh, rupee terms meat dairy poultry products there is an increase of 111% 111% in dollar terms rice there is an increase of 25% then there are other cereals are 415% so this will answer it so this is an encouraging i am saying the coming time is very positive for the processed food sector and for the food sector in general for india and for india to export to the world you talked about digital digitalization that i tell you technology and this has to this is already inbuilt in our uh, functioning india is one of the few countries in the world who have been Uh, introduced web based traceability complete web based that's why we are able to send grapes to the europe because of the web based traceability we have we started web based traceability in organic products we were probably the only country the first country in the world who started web based complete from farm to the um, to the exit point until it is reached to the buyer complete web based traceability so now we are introducing blockchain technology in many of the sectors yes in process food sector the modernization and automation the technology that is required more of course it is coming up but we need more only then the economies of scale will come here the role of investors will come they have to invest in the improving the technology so that we have volume quantity and economies of scale that of course needs to be done but um, uh, in, uh, the future of processed food industry is very bright dr rajaj you. you are no 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 you thank you you're a terrific advocate and uh, i was going to say not only does it appear the future is bright listening to you you think that the past is equally bright where we've come and where we've come to today has also been a good story 
in spite of the past year. And that's terrific. And I'm going to take that opportunity that you opened. You spoke about the poultry industry. You spoke about the meat industry and some rumors and whatnot. And I want to turn to Mr. Trattori. Mr. Trattori, during the past few months, uh, many of the industries were affected by the pandemic, including your industry, the poultry industry. Uh, for example, we heard about uh, chicken culling activities due to pricing conditions, and we heard rumors of the virus spreading through meat consumption. Um, and, and, you know, Dr. Prajaj touched on that in a minute. So my question is, how important was consumer education and awareness? And what were the key government initiatives that were aiding uh, the sector in that regard? Yeah, I think beginning of last year, Mark, uh, I think around Jan, uh, middle of Jan and all that. So so social media, WhatsApp and all that rumors started going around on that. And, and I think it was to an extent understandable. That nobody knew what was happening. The situation was so scary for everyone, right? And, 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 and with that, uh, 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 so it was actually quite bad for us. And actually the lockdowns were really, by then I think we went through the worst part, you know, and in some ways the lockdowns actually helped people move towards processed product. Uh, so, and then although the overall market was getting beaten up, we were getting beaten very badly because like uh, uh, Bhupinder Singh was saying, uh, close to 90 plus percent of our chicken is still in, is not processed or primary processed as I was saying. So we were getting beaten, but the processing industry started, you know, the online guys and processed chicken and all that. I think for the processed chicken, COVID was the best uh, thing to happen, uh, frankly. Uh, the second wave uh, uh, in Hyderabad, uh, I've seen the sales for these online branded guys has gone up, I think, close to 400 to 500 percent. Uh, so so it, it, so that that way it was good. I mean, in, 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 there's a positive there, I guess, in somewhere there. Um, and uh, and government, uh, I think uh, um, I think it was a lesson for all of us, Mark. Uh, it, it's something that happened. It was it's easy to sit and uh, look back and blame that you know everything should have been done phenomenally well and all that. But I think uh, I don't think that's possible. I mean, anyway, anyway, I'm not going to sit on that. But the point was, yes, it took them some time. But I think ultimately. Government came across. They they went around. They they they, uh, they spread the message and all that, and that's what helped us a lot. Uh, and, uh, and 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 you know and uh, as I said, by the time the lockdown came and all that, and and uh, we still suffered a little bit, not as much as uh, you know uh, this thing. And uh, uh, and like. Again, they helped us a lot in processing plants, moving, allowing chicken to be moved. Um, maybe after 15 days of the lockdown was announced. And you need to appreciate in their shoes, nobody had any clue what was happening. The fear mongering going on, um, you know, the so-called experts, uh, I don't know. I think they are from Chicago, if I'm not wrong, saying that, you know, 50 million Indians will die, 100 million Indians will die. Uh, you know, some all kind of crazy numbers were being thrown around. And uh, and in that, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, but then overall, I think now, um, again, uh, chicken, I'm not sure, I've not heard the government numbers, but I know eggs, they're saying last two years, it's gone up eight, eight eggs per capita. So from 75, from some, something like 73, they're saying it's gone up to says 81. Now that's a phenomenal number, Mark. That's, that's like, I think if I'm not wrong, that's almost a Germany added. Uh, you know, if I'm not wrong, I think uh, actually it's, I think, more than that. I think three or four eggs is a Germany. Uh, I think we maybe added two Germanys in these uh, two years. So, and I think that's pe people's uh, realization that they need to eat high quality protein uh, is, is, is something that's definitely coming through. Um, of course, as an industry, I think we have a job to do in communicating that. And, and I think government departments, which are relevant departments, we need to work together on this. But again, uh, like Dr. Bajaj was saying, the opportunity is, uh, is, is is almost guaranteed. The point is who who will jump in and take it. Uh, you know, they say India will be a twenty trillion dollar economy by uh, twenty forty. Uh, so that means, uh, and and if you mark, if you study, uh, the one of the first beneficiaries of uh, of a jump from two thousand to eight thousand or ten thousand GDP 
is going to be protein consumption. And it has always been that. Uh, it's been the same in US, it's been the same in Japan, in Europe, uh, China, uh, wherever you study, it's, uh, of course, from 20 to 40, that doesn't jump up as much, right? I mean, it, it really doesn't go up, but up to $10,000, and I think India has now hit the sweet spot now. And I think, uh, and, and, uh, and COVID actually has told people that they need to focus on their nutrition a lot and, and protein becomes very important in that. And it is the most important uh, macro. Uh, and so, yeah, I think, so processed products, ideas um, are what people are looking for. That's what we discovered. We started doing some basic stuff and we saw great traction for that uh, because people were tired of... Uh, you know, many of them didn't have cooks coming, restaurants were closed, so they had to cook and they were bored. So they were look, they were so looking for ideas and now they're they settled on that, right? I mean, because that's become a habit for many. And I think it's for us to take advantage of that, uh, Mark. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm one of those people who maybe consumed incremental eggs in terms of Germany myself. Uh, and I appreciate that analogy but the protein piece is important and it's all as it relates to the consumer. And as a result, I wanna to go to Mr. Singh. And since we're focused on the consumer side here for just a minute, um, I, I think I've got a two-parter for you really. And that's how has COVID changed the consumption habits in the ready foods market? Okay, that's B1. And then if you could touch upon any of the supply chain challenges that you faced and how you managed through them there at OSI. But COVID, actually, what we have seen has accelerated the growth of e-commerce, right? We have seen platform with online deliveries of RTC and RTE, and also fostered the adoption of new models of delivery. We had huge new launches during the COVID period, right? We launched about 10 to 15 uh, products under the brand called MasterChef or ITC during this period because the consumer were looking alternative and this is was the speed to the market. We need to give solution to the customers. So we were able to give them a different type of products as, as lockdown was there. So we there was an opportunity and people wanted to try packed product. This, this will further raise awareness of good quality and safety of the product. Once they have packed fruit, a product, they know the nutrition value, they know the shelf life of the product, every information that has built the intake of the consumer. We have seen growth in every category, either it's a convenient food products or it is a delivery product, right? We have seen uh, that uh, the delivery model e-commerce companies have did a very big role in making a product available to the consumer at their doorstep, right? Uh, I'll give you a lot of companies are using, uh, nowadays use uh, cloud kitchens to cook and pack and give the product to the consumer. This change, that way, the consumption of the product, ha we have seen packed food product going up. And also, uh, uh, since uh, we see nutrition value, people are looking into uh, the protein contents and uh, uh, the fat and the salt percentage during this uh, COVID period, we have seen that growth. In fact, the top food safety concern this year was not foodborne illness or chemicals, but contamination from food handlers, right? So mm -hmm. on preparation to, in the light of pandemic, so the packed food uh, product growth, because it is packed, it is sealed, right, and it is delivered, uh, we have seen growth jumping. And, and uh, when on the second question on supply chain, yes, there were challenges, right? Uh, lockdown did help uh, to curtail it. But then also, since food sector come under essential services, we maintained social distancing, we coordinated with the supply chain. I think so in India, people are, uh, are are tough to take these challenges to see the, how they can service. And food is like a service, right? And uh, so every, every food company is ensured that, uh, you know, the medical checks are there, the whole I, uh, protocol, protocols are followed and, uh, and we could service our customers during this pandemic. There was 
shortages of raw materials, but it was ensured the transportation, uh, the transports are uh, are allowed of food category to move interstate, right? And the products are available, and uh, the truckers, the sanitation systems were better, which kept us moving, and we did not have any challenge on supplying material to our customers or getting materials from the farms. You know, both you and Shiresh spoke to some of the practical on ground type of realities you faced. I appreciate hearing that. I know the audience does as well. I wanna turn, if we can, to the government initiatives that we touched on briefly and ask a question of the Consul General. Um, many of these things were started in the middle of the pandemic to promote the sector. We've spoken to the issue of PLI uh, in the presentation and so did you mention it. Uh, so U.S. food companies, they're positioning for global expansion. And in addition to PLI, the landscape for the food processing industry is changing with the promotion of uh, higher food processing and value addition. I, I wonder if there's anything else you'd like to mention with regard to these factors and what they've been able to generate in terms of larger interest amongst the U.S. players that want to set up in India. Uh, thank you, Mark. I, uh, I, I'll just, I'll be brief in my response, but I can certainly share with you that in my discussions with some of the food processing companies in the U.S. Midwest region, there is a, certainly a greater interest, but um, last year, many companies have held on to their expansion plans, and this, this is not something which is confined to the food processing sector. It was uh, among other companies, say, in in electrical machinery or manufactured products and so on. So I, I think we will see likely resumption of expansion plans and activities. Um, uh, some of the US companies uh, represented in India are already looking at that. And uh, I think, again, if we look look at this, uh, the statistics that have been shared by Dr. Bajaj about how uh, what we achieved $40 billion of food processing exports last year, despite the fact that a quarter of the year was really, the industry was not functioning. I, I think these are good pointers which reflect both potential uh, for exports and expansion in the domestic market. And, and again, uh, we, should know, we should take cognizance of the fact that um, COVID has induced behavioral change in the consumers in India. There is wider acceptance of food, processed food, frozen foods, ready to eat preparations and so on. So, uh, so and, and as some of the previous, and I think it was Mr. Chituri who mentioned that uh, some of these things will, will come to stay on in terms of uh, consumer behavior. So that also opens up new opportunities. So I'm, I'm fairly confident that uh, we will uh, see uh, more growth uh, in terms of investments from U.S. companies, uh, increase of the footprint in India. Um, Dr. Bajaj may be able to tell, uh, tell more, but I think we also uh, had significant investments in the food processing sector last year. I saw some reports, but I don't have a handle on accurate figures, so I don't want to mention that. But I do want to refer to that. Thank you. Thank you, and, and let's go ahead and, and turn our attention uh, to Dr. Prajaj since you've opened the door here. We know that some experts um, seem to suggest that the framework of the food processing PLI is more focused on import substitution rather than value addition, which aids in larger exports. Now, you've already talked about the significant growth, even in spite of the pandemic, of some of the exports. So what is your opinion on the PLI, and do you expect it to aid further the exports of agri and processed food produce from India? It will help in both ways. It will help in developing exports, developing domestic uh, infrastructure, which is required, and also um, strengthening our own existing base. Now I'll tell you how. PLI scheme has an important segment that is investment. One has to make an investment to become an eligible for getting the PLI scheme. As I had mentioned in the, my previous uh, uh, talks that we need modernization automation and that is required to bring economies of scale that requires investment. At the same time, we need to uh, brand India, establish brand India and market produce of India internationally. 
for that also you require an investment so that investment they will be bringing for developing the sector for improving the brand and strengthening the brand and also the making produce of india popular in the international market now this pli scheme is linked to production linked as it says name also it is production linked now once you somebody has improved the production and that will be both in the domestic sector and the internationally export sector both ways they will be developing and then only they'll get the money that's why you know this scheme is i think very well poised it will help in meeting the demands because you see we are a 1.3 by billion population we also need to strengthen we also need a good quality uh, affordable good food so that also is required and our you see purchasing power is increasing of course don't go on the covid time because covid time all economies are affected why only india all economies are affected but we are in general purchasing power is increasing so we also need good quality food within india and at the same time will uh, help in exports also i don't think this is import substitution this will help in you know whatever is the import is coming to india of course um, uh, we are uh, um, uh, it is 1.1 percent share of import of world we have it and our exports are 2.1 percent in the world so that means we are a net exporter we have continued to be the next exporter import substitution will be in very uh, small way because of this pli scheme in general of course working towards in import substitution in many other sectors especially oil seeds because we are the largest importer of oils in edible oil so we are helping and pulses you know we are the largest importer um, we used to be now of course for past one or two years we have starting last to last year we were almost uh, self sufficient only last year there was 10% requirement still we feel we will continue to um, help, it, go for import substitution in a um, significant way same in case of uh, oil also and that sector is not covered in pli so pli has successfully uh, chosen those sectors which will help in strengthening domestic base at the same time exports also thank you thank you no, thank you dr brajaj and i i want to remind the audience to submit questions that they have i've seen a couple of come in we only have a couple of questions left and uh, I'll ask some from the audience as well. And it seems, Mr. Singh, the audience wants to hear from you with regards to PLI. So we've discussed the scheme. Uh, everybody seems to have had a little bit of comment on it. And the question is, what are your views on the overall PLI scheme? And uh, how do you think it'll promote the sector? If you'd I care to so. comment on that. Yeah, Mark, PLI is a good initiative from the government of India to target required investment and focus for driving sales and exports. And also as the companies with potential for growth significantly with government support, the ecosystems around them and the supply chain associates with the companies will also grow eventually leading to an overall growth of the industry. We, uh, yes, for uh, there are schemes for startups and uh, uh, the only thing is there are some conditions of having a turnover, uh, you know, in the PLI, I think. So that is what, again, the scheme is being worked out. But this would help us on, as Dr. Bajaj has said, this would help us on economics of scale. We will be more competitive because food industry was very small scale earlier, if you go 10, 10 years back. And these schemes will create capacities and we will be competitive in Indian market and also for exports. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chaturi, you're, you're uh, gonna get a question here from the audience as well. And it's what would be the top 10 key drivers or success factors for the food processing industry in the future? And I'm not gonna ask you to name 10. So why don't we just look for the top three key drivers um, as you might comment on that. Yeah, I think so, uh, 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 Mark. I think uh, uh, it's uh, it's it's a chicken and egg thing, right? I mean, consumers can't buy what is not available, and and uh, and, and and somewhere I think, uh, uh, but I think we were to a large extent. I think uh, for people investing, they were not sure 
uh, you know, would the consumers buy? I think uh, somewhere with the COVID and all that, I think that opportunity is now uh, here. Uh, so now it's about uh, investments that need to happen. And as I said, uh, to me, the most uh, uh, critical thing here is actually uh, the financing uh, side, right? And, and, and availability of capital. Uh, Indian banks, uh, for whatever reason, are not, uh, you know, uh, they're still, I would say, stuck on, uh, uh, you know, old school. Uh, I mean, because like people like uh, Bupinder and all that and people supplying to Bupinder for last 25 years have not really been uh, in a very happy situation. Bupinder probably is, but not the people supplying to him. Not because of him, but then that's there are various reasons around that, right? Uh, and as I said, the biggest issue to me was, uh, uh, is, you know, the banks expect us to pay our money back in five to six years uh, for a plan that operates for 20, 25 years. Um, and uh, so which, which is where I think we are adding very heavy cost uh, to the investors uh, because uh, like in US, I think you get 12 to 15 years. So compared to that, the return I have to generate in the first five years is close to 20% higher just to pay off my, my loan. So I think that's one of the most critical things, uh, uh, Mark, and I think that needs yeah. to uh, alter. Uh, and uh, so I think that's, that's, that's one of the most critical things as, as I feel. Uh, I think uh, maybe on some of these critical questions, I think there's one of the questions here. Uh, on um, uh, what the equipment needed and all that, maybe uh, the taxes could be uh, helpful uh, to do to help us uh, uh, get these things in. Um, but I think uh, so. Those are some of the things for sure. And uh, uh, but other than that, I think uh, we have we do need to come up with more ideas, right? Like Bupinder was saying, he, he's launched twelve products and he's facing success, right? Because again. Uh, how would people buy something that is not available, right? I mean, if Upinder is not making, I don't know, chicken biryani and selling in packets in supermarkets, people will not be buying uh, from supermarkets, right? Because it's not available. So I think that's where I think uh, uh, is the opportunity now. And not only that, I think uh, if you look at the amount of uh, Indian food being exported to a place like UK, uh, you know, paratas and, and you know, and, and, and these things, it's, it's actually, I think it's close to a billion dollars plus now, or maybe more. Uh, so I think that's where, you know, if uh, uh, I think the world uh, will love Indian flavors, uh, maybe not everybody will eat the spice level I eat, uh, but, you know, but I think, uh, but I think it's, it's, it's picking up really. Uh, Mark, I remember when I came to US first time in 96, uh, almost nobody used to have a spicy uh, version of anything, right? Wendy's probably launched a spicy nuggets and it was started doing well. And now you know the chicken wars with uh, what uh, Popeye, Popeyes and all that. It's all spicy stuff now, right? I mean, of course, it's not the spice level we eat, but, uh, but then that's not the point. But I think Indian flavor is, um, especially if you start looking at a healthy lifestyle and cutting down on salt in Western food, I think you have to spice it up. And, and I think that is where, uh, you know, uh, that's where I think Indian flavors uh, uh, have a huge opportunity for us. Um, and I think, uh, so I think the critical thing is, I think the funding uh, side of it, Mark, um, because I think, uh, yeah, I think that needs to be, and people who have the funds have the advantage. And, and, and that's where I feel uh, foreign investors are looking at this will have a huge advantage over us Indians. Uh, because, uh, yeah, it's it's not that easy for us to uh, think about these things and take risks. Yeah, it's um, it's very interesting discussion across the board, I have to say. And I want to just um, let the audience know, I'm, I'm sad to say, I'm looking at the clock and I'm seeing the questions. So uh, for those that have not been answered, please know that we will answer you in writing. Uh, we promise you that. But this does kind of bring our panel discussion to an end. And we do hope you've enjoyed the session. Uh, I have a special guest uh, and a thank you note from our group executive chairman, Guljit Singh. So I hope you'll stay with us. Guljit happens to serve as our group executive chairperson at Nextdyne. Uh, he's got over 47 years of diverse business experience in the global medical device sector. 
his proven track record of delivering and sustaining progress across all geographic markets. At Nextdyne, he is guiding the organization's rapid growth and future expansion plans by providing the necessary leadership and guidance for our evolving organization. Now, as I understand it, uh, Gulget's a bit under the weather, and uh, unfortunately, it does affect his voice. So he has asked our Vice President of Global Marketing, Manoj Kidvani, to deliver Gulget's message. So, uh, Manoj, if you're listening in, I'll over to you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I won't take too much of your time. Just a few minutes to say a few words on behalf of our group executive chairman, Guljeet Singh. Uh, we're just about to wrap up yet another webinar from our series, Diversify to Differentiate, Think India, Think Next. Today's session was hosted by Next Time with support from the Council General of India, Chicago. And I would like to thank the Council General, Honorable Mr. Kumar, and his team for their continuous guidance and assistance and further support. In the recent past, we've seen increased investments from the US in India, most notably in the form of FDI, which has increased more than three folds as compared to the previous year. The food processing industry is one of the focus areas of next time. We support several organizations from this industry across the globe and provide them with integrated solutions navigating complex challenges. We also publish many thought leadership articles and have a dedicated team that follows any development and intricacies of the industry. First, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our global audience without whom this event would have not been, would, would have been uh, not possible. I would also like to thank our distinguished pan panelist, the Council General of India, in Chicago, Honorable Amit Kumar, Dr. Taru, Tarun Bajaj, uh, Mr. Suresh Chaturi, and Mr. Bupender Singh for making yourselves available for this webinar and also sharing your valuable insights. And of course, Mark, as usual, you've done a wonderful job and thank you so much for moderating this session. Finally, I would also like to thank and congratulate the Next Time team from across the globe, especially from our colleagues in the US, Canada, and India, who worked tirelessly behind the scenes to organize and put this webinar together. With this, we come to the end of our sixth webinar on our series, Di uh, Diversified, Differentiate, Think India, Think Next. Uh, please stay safe and healthy. Uh, this is on behalf of our uh, chairperson, Mr. Guljeet Singh, and my name is Manoj Gidwani, and I'm the VP, and I'm responsible for global marketing at next time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Manoj. And Guljit, thank you. I know the audience can see you, and I'm sure wishing you well, as I do, and everybody at next time that your voice comes back. And thank you very much for joining us. To the audience, um, in addition to the questions that are submitted, if you have any other questions in line with the discussion today for us at next time or for any of our panelists, uh, if, since we're unable to address them due to time constraints, please do share them with us at thinknext at nextdime.com. And our team will be very happy to respond. Across the globe, we do think next at next time and we invite you to do the same. We welcome all of that feedback on today's presentation. Please be vigilant, please stay safe. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye, thank you, thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, Mark. Thank you Thank all you. so much. Thank you.